fun. And we're live, everybody. A round of applause for tonight's show. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for having me. All right, so quick intro. So as you know, Speak Up Monday, every Monday here at Tropical Nomad. This is episode 416. Now this is about, tonight is a, is a really, it's a special show because um, our guest, Renat, so we, we met some years ago just before COVID and hopefully this won't herald anything right tomorrow. But the last show that we did was the eve of the lockdowns in Bali. And after that, the lockdowns happened, right? We kept on doing Speak Up Monday, by the way. But the lockdowns happened. And so that's interesting. And then in that time, you know, your wife is Indonesian, you were living here and then you went back to Zurich, um, back to Switzerland and we're going to talk about exactly what, what happened in tonight's interview. But just for you at home, if you're just tuning in, so tonight is all about climate action. But there's another story behind that, which is about entrepreneurism, right? So as you're going to hear, so Renat in the climate action space scaled a company from zero to one of the largest in the world. Now, from the outside, that sounds like a beautiful, incredible, inspirational story, and it is. Now, the thing that you may be not realizing is that there are so many challenges which are inherent to that, which you won't read in the newspaper, right? But as a founder, as an entrepreneur, you might be able to relate to. And as I was kind of saying to some people earlier on today was, you know, who would you want to learn from if you're entering the climate space, if you're entering the entrep entrepreneurial space and you have grand ambitions? I would want to learn from a guy who's not only been there, but also been hurt as well, you know, been, not physically, uh, but been, you know, on the tough side of entrepreneurism, you know, vilified in the media, scandal, and these sorts of things, but also a person who has managed to remain a sense of self throughout it all, and a person who's managed to remain clear on what their direction of, on life is. So I want to learn from a person like that to help me optimize, maximize, and minimize effort time, mistakes, resources. So tonight's show, I want you to listen with this entrepreneurial ear, right? If you're in the space, if you're not in the space, or you're in any entrepreneurial space, listen with that ear on what it takes to overcome the types of challenges that you can face and how to overcome them. So these, this is really, really, really important. And the last thing before I actually introduce him is, you know, is this understanding that you know, like there are many of us, I include myself, right, who's like an armchair climate action person, right? And the minute I'm going to ask you who, who you are, right, and you're going to tell me the truth. What that means is that I am involved, but I can get into the rhythm of like putting my hand up and pointing a finger saying and having an opinion on something when I'm not actually qualified to have that opinion, so what tonight is also about is about, you know, those who are maybe starting the journey, realizing that, you know, the size of what you do has an impact on how people will respond to you. If you're small and boutique, then people have positive, powerful things to say because you're on the rise. If you're the largest player in the industry, then it's a different set of rules and criteria that you're judged on, which are not always fair or accurate. So, so we're, we're going to get into, in, into all of that, but what I'd like to do first, um, just explain that uh, next week's show, uh, we have Miss Indonesia, so just watch out for that, for those of you who want, want to attend. Now, my name is Robert Ian Bonick, um, I'm the founder of Speak Up Monday, and also the founder of RIB and Associates, which is a growth strategist in and a gateway to Indonesia for foreign and domestic companies. Now, let's get on to tonight's show. So, I think what I'll start with is that I'll ask uh, Renat, who's been very patient with me, uh, to kind of introduce himself so you get an idea, you know, on, on who he is, uh, what he's done, and why he is the person that, that he is. And then we'll get into the nature of this tonight's Q&A, and I'll give us some guidelines of what we're going to cover um, after Renat has introduced himself. So, Renat, thanks, brother. Over to you. Thanks a lot. And uh, once again, thanks, Rob, for having me, and thanks, uh, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, I'm from Switzerland, from so Zurich. Not, this might, might over might here. Might not work? Yeah. Like the, I have to click on. Yeah. Good. So, I'm from, originally from Switzerland, from Zurich. But when I was 16 years old, I had this idea to spend a year abroad as a high school student. And I went to Jakarta, Indonesia. 
and spent one full year with my host family there. And it was basically the one experience which changed my life, I should say. I learned the language, I learned the culture, and I understood for the first time, keep in mind, 16 years from Zurich, Switzerland, super protected, everything is, is, is clean and all that, that it is, life is different, life is challenging and there's trade-offs. You want to have economic development, social development, environmental protection, there's trade-offs, specifically in countries, in emerging economies like Indonesia. And that was a game changer. I came back to Switzerland to study environmental sciences, came back to Jakarta once again, for a full year working for an NGO in the space of uh, air pollution and pollution control. And wasn't a bit unsure what to do next. And uh, in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol for, climate, uh, for preventing climate change was uh, signed, not ratified, but signed. And the Kyoto Protocol had an interesting element inside, which was called the flexible mechanisms. Now, what is a flexible mechanism? A flexible mechanism is a way to fund projects elsewhere and account for the carbon emission reductions in the invested country. And me and a few colleagues found this super interesting because it finally solved a problem we always had. How do you make a business? How do you create entrepreneurial opportunities in places like Indonesia and everywhere else while protecting the climate or environment. And that's fast forward how we first created a foundation called My Climate and later on the company South Pole, uh, which uh, ultimately became very big. But in, um, in, high, in essence, it was all driven by this desire to act for the environment, for climate, for biodiversity, but not just with donations, but with an approach that actually creates business opportunities. That was, has always been driving us. You know, and thank you. I mean, to also, you know, fill in a few, a few gaps. Uh, Renat was named Social Entrepreneur by the World Economic Forum's Schwab Foundation, is an elected member of the Innovation Council for the Swiss government, is a YPO Global Impact Award winner, and serves uh, on, on various boards. He owns, uh, holds a master's degree in environmental science from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and has completed executive education uh, programs at INSEED and the Harvard Kennedy School. So, I mean, see, again, the, the thing that, that makes me smile about you is that you have a deep background, right? And as you said, you know, the, there's things that were driving that and you wanted to find the answer and it was presented to you through the Kyoto Protocol. And so, look, tonight's show, what I really want to um, dive into, and I'll just give you a little summation, everybody, of what we're going to do. Uh, sorry reading from this, but it's better that I do that today. So we're going to talk about you know, the challenge of being an, an entrepreneur in the space of climate, an enormously political topic in a hyper-polarized world some of the key lessons when scaling quickly to over a thousand employees, lessons from dealing with the media, I think we all like to know that one, the challenge of doing business in both industrialized and emerging markets, and how you can learn, grow, and improve as a person when going through intense periods of hardship and success. So these are the areas that we're going to touch upon tonight. I can put those notes down for now. So let's start with, uh, with the journey of South Pole. You know, uh, what is it? What was it setting out to do? And let's go through that first. Yeah. Sure. So South Pole was created in 2006. It was uh, the five of us. Uh, three of us were classmates at the Institute, which is mentioned. And two others were friends we, we, we knew from back then. And as I said before, the idea was actually very simple. The Kyoto Protocol came with this flexible mechanism and our goal was to spread out across the world and just find as many entrepreneurs as possible who would partner with us and who we could co-fund their projects yeah. to reduce emissions. And initially those projects were typically small scale renewables, energy efficiency, we had a lot of biogas projects in Indonesia. We had a lot of composting projects, uh, municipal solid waste, and so on and so forth. Later on, 
and we will probably come to that point, we also ventured into forestry projects, afforestation, forest conservation, peatland restoration, and many more. Um, so, the, but the idea was always the same. The idea was always the same. Um, if you run a project anywhere, in Bali for instance, and you're absorbing CO2 or you're avoiding CO2, you should get a price for that. So it changed the needle, right? It's, it, it's such as a donation because you're a good guy. Mm -hmm. It's a payment for a service. Namely, you help us cleaning up the climate. And so it's a payment for cl a cleaner earns payment, in a way. Mm -hmm. That was the whole uh, idea. The company uh, scaled quite quickly because the Kyoto Protocol provided uh, a demand. So you had countries like Switzerland and Belgium and Holland and Germany and all those countries who had an obligation under the Kyoto Protocol. And as a part of that, they were keen to procure those credits. And so that's the, uh, based on that, the company grew quite fast uh, until 2012. And we were about 100 people back then. And then we had the first huge, massive, big crisis. Namely, as some of you remember, to the shock of everybody, the financial crisis came, 28, 9, mm -hmm. and that would have been the moment to extend the Kyoto Protocol yeah. beyond 2012. Yeah. And guess what? It didn't happen. It collapsed. And gone was this market. So prices collapsed from 12 euros to more or less zero. Total oversupply. So yeah. our company was at the edge of going out of business. A lot of companies went bust. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time we really had to think, what are we doing next? You know, so part of tonight, and thank you for getting a chair for this young lady. In a minute, that's why I was temporarily distracted. You're, you're walking around, it's like, someone get her a chair. <laughs> thank, thank you for sitting down. You're welcome. So, look, tonight we mentioned, you know, is about what you can impart to you know, upcoming climate entrepreneurs, which I see here. So, maybe what we do in the audience, if you would class yourself as a climate entrepreneur, or an entrepreneur in the space, a green entrepreneur, just raise your hands for me. Yeah, keep the hands up nice and high. Higher Severio, higher, higher Matt. All right, good. Great, so that's about half, half of the room. Great, thank you. So for their knowledge and for those watching, you know, give us you know, some of the, the lessons you know, that you've learned along the way in the, in the aspect of scaling. Sure, yeah. So the just to understand why and how we scale, right? It was not a straight way up, that's, for, that's the first lesson. Scaling is not just one directional. When the Kyoto Protocol collapsed in 2012, we had to reverse scale. I mean, we had to shrink the company back then because the, the market was gone. And we had to regroup, we had to close a few offices. We had to, uh, about a quarter of our offices that we had around the world had to close down because there was no more market. And we regrouped around the new model. And the new model was that we started to sell the carbon credits no longer to governments, but to corporates. Yeah. So it was a, vol a voluntary uh, buying. On top, we added uh, data and consulting play. So we served the same companies with new products. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps a, a second lesson for scaling. You know, the, the circumstances can change. And if, if and when they do, you have to adopt their model, your model, looking at what you're good at doing. For instance, we had a big network of clients, and then we started to, s to serve them with other products that, that we had. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's, that's certainly a, a for, like, be, be ready to change the model if yeah. and when the circumstances change. You know, one thing which I thought was, was really interesting when, when we spoke about it, uh, like maybe during, during last week, was, you know, about the values and through scaling quickly, how you maybe don't get that opportunity to instill those values and what repercussions that, that can have. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Rob. So um, one thing that was always very important to us at South Pole was actually those values. Perhaps you don't know why the company is actually called South Pole. It stands for our mission and our values in a sense. It stands for the South Pole uh, where all the ices and the penguins, we want to keep it there. We don't want that to melt. So it's about climate uh, protection. But the second reason is also South Pole. It's about the global South, where we want to add value. And so those are key uh, elements of our work that the whole company was actually, a, or is, a, a mission-driven 
company. To your point, what, what happened um, when, so fast forward, when we met here in 2019, yeah. interestingly enough, I'm sure some of you remember, the COVID pandemic did not kill the climate movement. As far, some of you remember, 2018, 19 was the big year of Greta Thunberg mm. on the street, Fridays for the Future. All of a sudden, a lot of uh, companies came out with plans to get active on climate. So it was a big movement, and then COVID came. But interestingly, COVID didn't stop that. Yeah. It actually accelerated the climate action wave. Mm. So companies made a connection between a global health crisis and the global climate crisis. Mm. So, it, the, so we decided that this is the moment where we should scale the company. So after we left Bali, the company grew quite fast from, I think when I was here, we had perhaps about 300 people, yeah. and two years ago we scaled to, to over 1,000 people. Yeah. And so, now so 300 people to 1,000 people in the space of a couple of years. Two, two years, yeah, two, two and a half years. And that was, in hindsight, of course, extremely fast. And perhaps too fast, because to your point, what happens is, and, and one additional problem was, a lot of the new colleagues were hired in home offices because it was COVID times. Yeah. So it was, it, it, we, we underestimated this, it was not as easy to convey the message why you're working at South Pole, what is making this company dif uh, different? Mm -hmm. And so we didn't observe that the, the views on what the company is doing, should be doing, should not be doing, were quite widespread. And of course, to instill one set of values, one uh, di strategic direction, is of course easier if you're 200 people than you're 1,000 people. That's what we learned. So then, okay, so then let's quickly recap. So you, you've got this incredible background, opportunity provided by a, a global change, a, a global with, the, as you mentioned before, the Kyoto. Then you found a way with some friends to come into a business with the best intentions. Sounds like most people starting businesses, right? The best intentions, you're excited. We're going to do this thing, right? So you're doing this thing. And then you have things, again, global crises that create another set of opportunities. So you, so you lean in to those opportunities. And then you have an opportunity now to scale. So you scale, as you mentioned, from 300 to over, over 1,000 in a space of a couple of years, right? Okay, and then you've, you've also, that we're gonna get to, is that you know, there are big challenges when you, know, you do miss that selection criteria when you're hiring human capital, because again, humans are an investment, staff are an investment, so the capital if you don't get that hiring process correct. Definitely. So in other words, if you hire people that don't share the company values or don't know the company values, if people come in with really like a whole different agenda, if you have 1,000 people, 1% 1 of those people maybe do, are not aligned to what you're doing, that might be 10 people. 10 people can create a whole lot of problems and challenges yeah. that you, so, so let's, let's dovetail into that and then we'll go into the part two of what happened in this other crisis. No, that's, a, that's of course absolutely true. I mean, it's pure statistics. If you would all agree with me, you have any company, 1% of people who just don't feel it, or just something is wrong. Maybe they just don't like their boss or they have a, something is just not right. They hate it, they don't feel it. Um, if you are, let's say, if you're 100 people, 1% means one person. You will find out who it is, you will have a conversation, you will try to fix it. But if you're a thousand, that's 10 people. And those 10 people together acting collectively can become quite noisy. Mm. And what we learned also is that even if you have 99% who are actually quite happy, the 1% unhappy is much more vocal than the 99% happy ones. So it's a little bit of a bias. So you, the, 10 unhappy ones can create more noise than 990 happy ones. And you would then think, oh shit, half the company's unhappy. Actually not, it was a small fraction. But uh, yeah, it, there's this bias in our brains that lets us, perhaps it comes from the Stone Age, right? The good news are not as exciting. The bad news, like one line in front of your cave, that's when your hormones start shooting. So it's, I think it's very human yeah. to look at one uh, like a bad story or a, a problem much more prominently than, Eve, than the, the whole rest. 
and you know, so that brings us neatly on to, so some of you, so when I was um, doing some research for this interview, quite late actually, uh, I'm probably one of the people who didn't know what happened, right? Do your research, Rob. So last year, you know, so I think there was a very tough year for carbon credit companies, um, politically, economically, and we'll, we'll get into this in a second. And so essentially, you know, it was, it was like a witch hunt, right? It, within the industry, looking for those to say, look, this thing doesn't work. And again, this is part of the thing about scale. When you're very small, then you're not going to be implicated or even probably seen. That's right. Yep. But if you're the largest player in the industry, well, they're going to come knocking. So again, that's this challenge of, we'll get some more seats for you coming in, please. So th this is, again, is the challenge of scale, right? When you're small, there's certain things you can do. When you're very large, you can't get away with the same things. So... What happened was, you know, I read uh, in the media, you know, that there were these allegations um, put forward by several journalists that, you know, South Pole wasn't doing the right thing, that it was implicated in greenwashing allegations. There was a, there was a, uh, one of the projects of the hundreds that you, that South Pole have done correctly and everything else, one project in Zimbabwe that didn't go as planned. And this led to, uh, again, media activity, it led to scandal for some, for others they're telling me, oh, no, it's a scam, uh, all of these words uh, coming into it. So again, what I'd like to do is defer to you because we all know, anyone who's an entrepreneur knows that there's the truth, <laughs> damn lies and statistics, there's also the truth, your version, the truth, someone else's version, and the truth, another version. So there's many different versions of the truth, and the one that makes sense, or the one that is True, true, doesn't always make it to the media. Because again, good news, bad news, it sells a lot. So again, um, so take us through what happened. Uh, and again, uh, in as much detail as you, as you choose, so we can get a better idea on what can go wrong. Yeah, so yeah. I think in order to understand what happened, it's important to understand the background. Mm. And as you just said before, Rob, exactly... The after I mentioned the Kyoto Protocol collapsing, and by the way, car markets were criticized also massively during the Kyoto days yeah. because they were big. Then they collapsed, yeah. and for a couple of years, there was silence. Nobody cared. Like, no, everybody thought, oh, great that you guys are still doing that. Good luck to you. It was all small, and even at the uh, 200 people, we were actually already back then the biggest company in the world. It just nobody took note. Uh, and we were quietly doing our thing, and perhaps started to be, you know, we, we believed, yeah, it's just the way it is. We have our, uh, keep in mind, every single project is externally certified. Yeah. So be, it's just a South Pole saying this is a good or bad project. It's every little ton has an external certification, actually two levels of external certification. Yeah. So we felt like, absolutely, I mean, we're, we're selling certified uh, credits and all is good. But what we underestimated was that was as long as the market was small. Then we mentioned the 2021, 22. All of a sudden, this market started going up like, like mad. Mm -hmm. Why was that? It was because uh, uh, big people like Mark Carney and Bill Gates and, and others said, mm -hmm. we have to fix the climate problem and it's not going to be good enough to reduce emissions. Mm -hmm. We will have to uh, fund, we have to uh, uh, allow companies to offset uh, their emissions uh, at scale, that's going to be a trillion dollar market, people said. Now, that, we didn't realize, that sparked the anger of NGOs. They said, wait, okay, you guys, you rich bankers and all that, you want to create a market to basically allow companies not to reduce, but to offset. Mm -hmm. That is greenwashing, we don't like that. And initially, we, we, we probably didn't take this seriously enough. We knew this because it has always been there. People have always criticized carbon credits. Uh, you know, it's, it's better to reduce. And we always had the very clear answer, of course, you have to do both. Yeah. You have to reduce emissions and you have to offset the rest. That was for the past 20 years, the same story. Yeah. So we felt like, well, same story, same story, nothing new. But this time was different. The anger of certain NGOs about potential... Uh, even energy companies, perhaps even oil and gas companies, getting into that market and buying credits. The idea was when they do that, they will no longer reduce emissions. And that is greenwashing. So the whole 
based the whole noise of last year was actually backed on this deep frustration uh, of NGOs that the instrument could, could be used for greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And sadly, and also that's something I, uh, we did not perhaps realize or too late, mm -hmm. there were cases of greenwashing, absolutely. There were some companies who just bought credit and said, well, I'm a climate hero. And perhaps in hindsight, we should have been more vocal. Mm -hmm. And we should have said, now, guys, you cannot do that. You cannot say that. So in hindsight, we, we should have been more clear that this is an instrument that is about funding projects. It's not about you now being a hero. This is just an instrument to fund projects. Leave it there. So that's the, 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 the background on, on why there was so much anger all of a sudden. Mm. So then, you know, as you mentioned, you've got the... But there's different aspects to this that create a sandwich. So one aspect of it is the NGOs. And you've explained that. But there's also another chair, please. Yeah. Also, there's, a, there's another political aspect. So can you explain that? I know you found yourselves in the middle of, like, of a storm. And that's the second yeah. problem. I just want, uh, that's, it's very important you mentioned that. On top of having a backlash, and I have to say, it's partly correct. I'm not saying these NGOs were totally wrong. There, there were cases of greenwashing, and the industry should have been more vocal. I'm totally uh, fine with accepting this argument. But on top of that, there was also a political uh, thing that evolved. Namely, the Paris Agreement actually has an Article 6, which in principle establishes again an option for governments to trade carbon with each other. What it means is that it's now all of a sudden a little bit unclear. If I'm doing a project in Indonesia, mm. isn't that actually the Indonesian government's carbon? Can I even claim that? Mm. Or is that double claiming or double counting? So there was a huge big noise around this idea. Mm. Uh, if, let's say, a Swiss company uh, runs a project in, 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 in uh, wherever, like Indonesia or, or Malaysia or Gabon or wherever, yeah. isn't that double counting? So that was... It's very complex to understand the concept, yeah. Yeah. but it, it was a topic that kept lingering. So this, uh, this uh, currently, right now, a lot of governments, including the Indonesian government, are creating rules, which is fantastic, for handling carbon. So I'm expecting that in a few years from now, you will have uh, rules from each country how you can do that. But right now, we're a bit in the limbo, because very few countries have, uh, have finalized their rules. So that was another reason why last year, not only was there an, a, like a, an, an attack from, from NGOs and media, but also there was political uncertainty, yeah. which also uh, basically was, was bad for prices and volumes. You know, so let's, let's reflect upon the entrepreneurial journey, right, from that perspective. So what we're talking about now is a person, a group that want to scale a company, want to be impactful. They end up scaling a company that's the largest, one of the largest in the world at what it does. It happens to be in an industry that is very politicized, um, very opinionated, uh, and very criticized because of the, 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 sh the shift in focus to the environment being this thing that governments, stakeholders, uh, those who want to be in the media want to start talking about. So now you find yourself in a bit of hot water because some of the rules are not quite clear on how to do this thing, right? How to do this transaction. Uh, you also get um, developing in a, in a developing country that also doesn't have, you know, necessarily, you know, the, the necessary framework or foundational understanding to actually make this thing work. So then from the articles which I read, um, which were a few, you know, there was this discrepancy uh, between the money going in and the credits being produced. Um, so I know that we can't spend all day on this, but this is probably the last part of it. So what would you say from an entrepreneurial journey perspective, you know, of going into a developing country? Because you're doing, and this is what I try and make people aware of, right? You're doing hundreds of projects, hundreds, no problems. One project, you get a problem. So what? So therefore, everything you do is bad? No, right? So working in developing countries, what are the things that you learnt that if that time would come again, or if anyone here, right, assembled or watching online, would say, you know what, there's this great opportunity in X country, we're going to go for it. 
what can you say to support, nurture, and earmark for them the things to be careful of? Yeah. So I think, first of all, we have to make one thing clear. It's not that there were 990 projects without problems and one has a problem. Mm -hmm. Let's be very open. In developing countries, in emerging economies, and even in Switzerland, even if you're building a house in Switzerland, do you think there's not a single problem? Of course there is. Yeah. There is always issues. One constructor is not doing his job properly, and then the roof is leaking, you have to fix it, it's extra cost, the guy's not... So, you know, it, 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 in, the, it, it, in the real world, there is no project that is just perfect. Yeah. There's always something. Yeah. And the question is, if you're waiting for that perfect project, you can wait forever. And I, 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 I wonder, anybody here in the room, in Bali, has anybody ever seen a perfect project that where nothing went wrong? It was just a absolute success from A to Z. Nothing went wrong. Come on. That is not, that's not the reality. No hands. It doesn't exist, right? No hands. I can see no hands. So, um, and the, the, the problem is now, if you want to criticize a project, of course you can. You will always find somebody... And uh, particularly complicated, it's when you go into agricultural projects or forest projects. Mm -hmm. These are huge. There's hundreds of thousands of people sometimes. There's mm -hmm. governments involved. There's stakeholders. You will always find somebody who is not happy. Mm -hmm. And if you then interview long enough, you will always find somebody who thinks it's complete rubbish, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's a bit my, my, my plea, perhaps a little bit. If, if this... I'm not, I'm not talking about carbon now. I'm talking about any kind of development project, any kind of investment. Yeah. If we cannot accept that occasionally things are not perfect or not going the, uh, the absolute perfect, we can start. Yeah. And that's perhaps uh, me as an entrepreneur, uh, that's about, that makes me, me a bit sad. As an entrepreneur, you're used to taking some risks mm -hmm. and you're, you're trying to do as good as you can, not just mm -hmm. sit back and, 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 and wait for others to move. Mm -hmm. And I believe this risk-taking must become fashionable again. Yeah. Right now, in the, especially the climate space, you see a lot of people being super scared yeah. of doing the wrong thing. And perhaps my last point, and I give it back, yeah. the attacks last year were not only on carbon, they were on everything. For example, ESG. Not sure if you know ESG stands for environmental, uh, social and governmental issues. Yeah. Bla uh, Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, for instance, he was a big promoter of ESG uh, funds. Mm. He got attacked and even sued from both sides. Mm. In, in the US, he got sued from the, uh, from the uh, not he, but, but well, he at least threatened to be sued from Republican states for vogue capitalism. Mm. Like you're wasting our shareholders' money on, on this uh, environment shit, right? But he got also, they got also taxed from the green left for greenwashing. Yeah. So it has, and that's why the title of this session has been hyperpolarized world. I think that's actually a problem we have today. Climate has become very polarized. On the one side, you have extremely radical views that the whole topic doesn't exist. It's a waste of money. It's, uh, an in, it's whatever. And on the other side, you have demands from the greens and lefts who are just unfulfillable. And that makes it very difficult for anybody, and I'm sure here in the room we have a lot of people in that camp who just want to get things done, who want pragmatic solutions to this problem. Yeah. That, that's a bit the challenge we're in, and uh, I, I do hope I can also, uh, for those who are listening or watching or sitting here, let's stand up for the pragmatic way in the middle. We have to be able to take risks and get stuff done, get projects done. Otherwise, this is not going to end up well with the climate crisis. So uh, we have about three questions left, and then we're going to go to you, the audience, right? So we'll put the third microphone out there, raise your hand. With these microphones, by the way, uh, traditionally microphones work well like this. Not these guys, just point it at your mouth. Three questions, and then we'll go to you. But just, if you have a question in mind, just think about what that is. Two opportunities, I get my fingers mixed up. Two opportunities for questions. This first set will be on camera. This camera over here swivels. And so if you ask a question, you'll be on camera, okay? The second opportunity will be after the cameras are switched off. So the YouTubes, the Instagrams, the Facebooks, all gone. And then that will be a private session that will not be recorded, okay? These are the two options that you have for questions. Okay, so the three questions, one, one at a time. So 
the footnote here for entrepreneurs about entering a foreign market, okay? You mentioned, you know, one thing about realizing that things won't be perfect, which I think everybody here understands that if you look down the road and there's cellular traffic lights equidistant from now for the next 100, 100, 100 uh, meters, not everyone is going to be green, right? Maybe the first two might be green and you're going to go for it, right? And work it out as you go. Um, so one lesson or one uh, takeaway is don't expect things to be perfect. Uh, another takeaway that, that you mentioned is the difficulty of making everyone happy. Right, so probably that's another unfulfillable expectation. So if there are one or two more that you would impart to those entrepreneurs that may be looking to go into foreign countries where they don't necessarily know how it works, what would you say to them? Uh, partnerships, absolutely. So 100% of all projects, and that's perhaps also some, uh, some people got wrong, because some people also criticize these markets for foreigners, let's say Swiss people coming to Asia or Africa telling people what to do. No. Not at all. Yeah. We did the opposite. Whenever we had an, an office in a country, we did not come with any technology or any pre conclusions at all. The one thing we did, we were looking for entrepreneurs. Who here has track record? Who has done it? Who knows what, what is doing? Who is, a, who, who is successful? And those guys, we try to scale. Yeah. So it's a bottom-up approach where you base everything you do on the local knowledge. Yeah. And I think then it, it, it can work. Of course, stakeholders, in uh, management, keep in mind it's not only one entrepreneur, it's also surrounding communities, it's mm. governments, it's local governments, mm. it's, it's a lot of people you have to, you have to work with. Yeah. But, but I would say partnerships is absolutely key. Got it. Great. So partnerships is key. So what people may or not, may not realize is that there was an uh, inordinate amount of probably not a tax only on your company, but on you personally, right? Media, and again, and just to be very clear, it's not all the media, as you mentioned before, it's segments of the media. Um, went with that story, there were members of your company that were leaking information, if I can say that, I just did. And this is part of that, you know, the, that 1% of people in your company, and we all have this gut feeling, right? We all have this intuition, you know, so what was missed uh, with the South Pole was that, yeah, that. So you mentioned that some of the staff were then leaking information, stealing information and leaking that to the media. I say this on purpose because many of you who are on the trajectory of moving up, these are really important things to remember, right? That's why I'm drawing a, a, a highlight to it. So look, this one is really important as well because founders, entrepreneurs, I see many in the room, you know, like... I think the most difficult part is dealing with your state of mind, right? Your own self-talk. Because if the world is doubting you, how do you stand up? You know, I remember watching a Michael Jordan um, documentary. Obviously, I love Michael Jordan. I'm sure most people here do. But how was he able to keep coming back when people doubted him? How was he able to keep that rhythm, that intensity, that focus, that hunger to keep pushing himself again and again and again, responding to speculation, responding from adulation and criticism, right? So I think the inner journey of the mind of the founder and entrepreneur is one that's maybe not spoken about enough. And part of the reason why this show is called Speak Up Monday is because, just a quick story, uh, in Sydney where I spent many years running successful hospitality companies, three people that I knew pretty well, I thought, were all successful, looked good, smelled good, had the right looking wife. Sorry, I just have to say it how it is, right? The 2.2 kids, the white picket fence, had everything. All committed suicide in one year. All three of them. No one saw it coming. I never saw it coming. And Monday is a day with research that I found out that heart attacks, the most heart attacks happen on a Monday. And those who are looking or thinking about ending their life and taking their life, one of the most popular days is Monday. So Speak Up Monday was all about how do we plant and drop a seed of positivity on a day when it's going the opposite way, right? So that's what this show is all about. People inspire people and unity and diversity, right? Which is the motto of Indonesia. So repeating the question, which I may, may have forgotten, but it is like this. How did you manage to protect yourself, to nurture yourself, to love yourself, love we don't use very much in entrepreneurism, at a time where people are attacking you personally in a big way that internationally the attention and the eyes are on you? 
not just the guy next door or the girl next door, but we're talking international media coming and say, this guy is bad, this guy is X, Y, and Z. How did you deal with it? Yeah, so of course it was uh, a, a, an experience I, I uh, don't want, uh, I wish nobody uh, has to have, especially because the, there was nothing actually behind it. It was, and perhaps the mistake we did or I did, I always followed the principle, show your facts, show your data, be open. That's by the way also why these data leaks could happen. We were pre a bit careless in protecting our data because I, we have nothing to hide. Any question, I'm answering. That was my rational, my principle all the way along. What I didn't understand or too late was that if there is a global storm which wants to bring down carbon and you happen to be the CEO of the largest carbon company, you have to watch out because they don't care what your arguments are. They don't even want to listen to your arguments. They want to create a shitstorm and um, that's that's a bit what uh, what happened that we, we understood so, so how do you I, deal I, with it how did you get through it personally how did you reflect deflect intuit and vibe move that ill will and ill feeling towards you how did you deal with that so one of course the i had a the important thing is i had people to support me most importantly my own family who was standing behind me very clearly, and a number of good friends mm -hmm. who saw through this. Even the competitors called me up and said, what the hell is this? This is complete shit. And I said, yeah. So I got a lot of support from a lot of people who actually saw this. And I even got other people who told me, shit, this happened to me too. Mm -hmm. It's actually interesting to how many people, if you're... Uh, once something like this happens to you, how many people stand and say, you know what, I had the same thing 10 years ago. Look, this is the articles they wrote about me. And, and so it does happen. I think one very important uh, lesson perhaps I, I can give mm -hmm. is you cannot, you can never ever change the facts. The facts are always the facts. There's absolutely no point mm -hmm. in basically being sad or whatever. The only thing you can influence is the future. The past is the past. Mm -hmm. And, and that's just, uh, even if it hurts, I think it's very important that you always remember, you can't, there's no point in being a poor victim and oh shit, this happened to me. No, that doesn't make any sense. The only thing that you can influence is your next steps, your next mm -hmm. conversations, your next moves. You go out again, you talk to people and gradually people will hear your version of the story too. Two things. Before I do that, um, Ayu or Guzman or Hadis, can you find some chairs for these two, please? Yeah, they're looking for some chairs. Thank you so much. I, I, I just, uh, when people come, I want them to be comfortable, right? Okay, back to you. Thank you so much, right? Because again, you know, what you're saying is that friendships, people coming, camaraderie. So other people coming saying, hey, same thing happened to me. I know what you're going through, right? Um, that's one, okay? Um, what else though? So uh, let me give you an, an example. So uh, in some of my toughest moments personally, where people have been coming against me saying all sorts of things, you know, one thing which I did was I remembered the successes that I've had in the past where I didn't think I might not make it. I thought I might not make it. But what I did is I reflected on the past saying, well, at the time, I didn't think or realize I would make it through, but guess what I did? So if I'd done it before, I can do it again. And so bringing these past successes into the present. Also this understanding and awareness that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we fail forwards, right? As a kid, when you're getting up, I have two kids, you have some, right? As a kid, you know, that they come, they stand up, they fall down. And they keep going, falling down, standing up, falling down. Do they give up and say, hey, you know, I can't, st I can't do the standing up thing. I'm just going to sit down for the rest of my life, right? No, they don't. They keep going, right? So these sorts of things were what I try to draw into my awareness to keep me going, knowing that, and this too shall pass. Right? I look at Alex over here at the front. He doesn't mean I'm going to pick on him. But I find that his mindset is very resilient as well, just knowing him as a person. Detlev, resilient. Toby, resilient. Henry, who are you? Resilient, right? I see Jen over here, resilient. So I see these... Um, you know, also, there you are, resilient too, right? So from that perspective, and then we'll move on after this, 
what is it that you can impart to other entrepreneurs that might face some of this? Um, also, how can they get through it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mentioned family and friends, very important. Get get support. Get go out with people. Another one I'll mention is sports. Okay. Keep keep moving. Keep doing sports. Keep running. Keep surfing. Keep whatever you want to do. Um, to to just like. Um, Clear, clear minds. Meditate if you if if that's or do yoga. Do do things that are good to you. Yeah. Be good to yourself. Don't be cruel. Don't spend too much time in. Oh shit! If I only had. Oh, I was so stupid. Why didn't I do? No, there's no point. I, once again, you can't change the past. But what a lot of people told me was exactly what you now mentioned. Yeah. These things pass. Yeah. People forget after a while. It's now you know it's. It, it, uh, they, they see things in different perspectives. New things come up. So, but while you're in it, it's sometimes hard to believe. Yet, do believe. These things go past. And, very important, if you have an opportunity, all those lessons, all those experiences I have now, and I, I hope that they will help me in new adventures, next thing I do, to be a better version of myself. More reflective, perhaps. Perhaps if we were a bit unconscious, I, I, I could tell you a whole string of mistakes with it. I might have never seen those had this not happened. So, but with this knowledge now, yeah. I can perhaps create a, a better version of all that. And what is the purpose in life, right? The purpose in life is to keep rolling, keep doing things, yeah. try to go where you find love, yeah. and try to, to move things small and big. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that, that belief and that passion uh, that flame should should stay on. Last question. Give Sean you know, the other mic. I know you had a question, right? Uh, we'll, we'll give that mic to you. Just put your hand up so Guzman knows who you are, right? So we'll give the mic to you. Last question, and we'll go to questions in the audience, right? It's this one here. So we've been through a bit of your journey, right? Didn't have time to do all of it. Um, and we haven't spoken about your Indonesian wife and, and the role that Indonesia and Bali's played in this uh, rejuvenation, this uh, healing, right? We can get to that maybe this time or another time. But we spoke about your journey, parts of it. We've we kind of intruded and given certain feedback, takeaways that can help budding entrepreneurs on their journey in that climate space, but in any entrepreneurial endeavor. Okay, great. We've got also the sense of, you know, when things don't go to plan, right? Understand that this too shall pass. Understand the importance of friendships and nurturing them on the way up. <laughs> nurturing on the way up and so on, right? So the, the, the last question for you, let me go to the audience, is so what is now? So what does the future hold for you? So what are you doing now? Like I know that you, you've stepped down as CEO of South Pole. So what are you doing now? And, and what would you like to see in the future from an entrepreneurial perspective in the climate space? So for me, that's the question I hope we can discuss right after the show because, uh, and in fact, even before the show, I already had one conversation about the potential venture on biochar in Sumatra. So you see these ideas keep flowing. I personally invested just two weeks ago in a data platform for uh, climate data media platform out of Italy, which I find really cool. It's a super cool business model. So. One thing I absolutely want to do is to work with other entrepreneurs, either as a, a board member or, or as a co-founder or, uh, or at least an advisor on new ventures. There's still so much to do. There's still so much to do. And of course, I'm still involved in South Pole. I'm still a shareholder in South Pole. Uh, and uh, so I keep, of course, supporting and helping the company, uh, even if I'm no longer the CEO. Um, but absolutely, I mean, there is so many years to come for climate action, and we are not there yet, right? It's the climate doesn't it doesn't look good, and there is no time to to lose. We have to keep keep pushing. Got it. Thank you, brother. So now we're going to go to questions. So we start with Sean. So when you get the mic, just give yourselves maybe five or ten seconds. So Guzman is the man on the wheels of steel. Can just mic you up and uh, get get the camera onto you. Remember, there will be a second opportunity, test, private test, questions, test. and so on. Okay, over to you, brother Sean. You good? I'm good. Looking handsome too, but handsome guys. Okay. You too, man. Thank you. You, um, Renat. You are from Zurich and uh, also I, I guess you studied at ETH. 
Uh, I come from a similar school. I, I, I studied in North Germany and I was also a big part of uh, sustainability economics and, and, and that whole school of thought. And when the 2015 Paris Climate Accord uh, was ratified, like there's something important maybe you guys didn't talk about that happens in that moment is that everyone agrees on a language and on a set of rules and standards and black is black, white is white, blue is blue, red is red, plus is plus, minus is minus, this is carbon, this is chemistry, right? There's a set of standards and rules that were ratified and it's a global language. And what Renat did was he tapped into that global language and into that agreement and scale a company based off of that. And um, I think something that you guys didn't talk about was misinformation and disinformation and the rise of social media. So similar to the trajectory of your company, social media scaled very quickly. And 2004, Facebook was founded, Instagram came quite quickly. In the last few years, we've seen TikTok and a few other platforms. Billions of users, we're talking billions of hours, billions, thousands of millions of hours every day on these platforms. Mm. And the, the uh, agreement that was made in 2015, everyone's somewhat forgotten about it. And everyone's lost in this social media cloud of misinformation and disinformation. And uh, so building trust into the future, I, I, you just talked about that company in Italy, I think that's super interesting. Like how, how can we reestablish trust in the future, in science, in environmental accounting, in, and how do we reduce complexity so everyone understands what we're talking about? Beautiful question, man. Well, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> that's exactly one key reason why I did invest in this company called Illuminum, by the way, it's the name. Uh, because I believe it's so important that we have new platforms. It's open source where uh, like the climate community comes together and actually shares views on a, on a high level. And, and I hope that this platform, Illuminum, will, will play its part to, to exactly this. And I, I think what, what you're mentioning is actually a very massive problem. And I like to make a comparison. Just look at this. On the one side, we have the fossil fuel industry, right? We have about 10, 20 companies who last year jointly made more than $1 trillion in profits, not revenues, profits. Imagine them just spending 1% of that money onto PR, how powerful they are. That's billions and billions every year for PR, uh, for PR. But it's only 20 companies, right? On our side, we have 20,000 NGOs, academics, professors, companies, activists, everybody who have all their views, uh, how to do it. They all, they all have best intentions. Yeah. But on our side, we don't have that firepower that the fossil fuel industry has. Mm -hmm. So while they have very targeted PR machinery, yeah. we have a cacophony of your views, many, many views. Mm -hmm. And everything you do is somebody always knows better, somebody has a better idea. And in principle, you would say, that's great. That's, demo that's like, like Mark Zuckerberg, it's a democracy of opinion. The problem starts when instead of, when this, this democracy of opinions becomes hatred. Oh, Rob, that project you did up in Ubud, I, I know it was bad. I would have done it much better. My technology would have been superior to yours. You're wasting people's money. So this is the kind of problem we have. We are up against an, uh, the fossil fuel companies who are super efficient in PR, and we are horrible at it. Yeah. And, and you know, the, uh, so I had a few chats with Sean about this as well and other people in the room. You know, by the way, uh, hands up for the next question, please. So just o over here, anybody, Hadis or Ayu or someone yeah, over here or Guzman. Um, and for you, yeah, okay, darling. So we've got about five, five questions there. So one of the things that we spoke about um, in any industry, right, it's this, uh, the, I was doing some work early on with a, they're called Bali NGO and Associates and um, two really well-meaning people behind it, three actually. And the biggest conversation that we had was this understanding of these two things, duplication, collaboration. So what they found was that you have, and I put myself in this, well-meaning foreigners coming in and say, oh, look, 
I can fix that problem, right? And there's a, there's a bit of ego, let's be honest. There's a bit of ego in there. It's like, oh, I can fix this problem, right? So instead of saying, well, let me do the research and see who else is doing something in this space already, how can I support them to have more impact, more, in, more effectiveness, maybe become more profitable or profitable. How can I help? And have that conversation at least. They still might say, no, I'm good. <laughs> no, 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 I don't, I don't need your help. I'm good, right? No, no, no. Fine, but at least try. But what was evident um, five times out of 10 or more was, no, I'm going to be on my white horse riding in. <laughs> I look good on the white horse, by the way. Riding in. <laughs> Black guy, white horse, you know how it is. Right? <laughs> Get a picture in your mind, right? But that's the problem. So they were kept on duplicating and failing. So you have waste of time, waste of resources, waste of impact, and then people are losing trust. That was a problem. Yes. Duplication and collaboration. There's a word called co-ompetition, another word which is about those who are seemingly in competition with each other collaborate together to increase standards and increase the size of the pie so everyone benefits. Yep. Yeah, so. Yep. Yep. yeah, so next question. Sorry, guys, I, I, I go on my horse, literally. So, Jen, <laughs> that horse analogy, where'd that come from? I'm sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you ready, Gus? Yeah, all right. So, Jen, you know what? Tell people what you're doing because you're awesome. And I should have told you the same thing, Sean. <laughs> yeah, so tell them what, what, what you're doing first. Okay. 30 seconds. I know you can do it. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm Jen Jennifer. I'm one of the co-founders of Scale Climate Action. We are a community and, and supporting the ecosystem here in Bali and supporting scaling climate action in Bali and Indonesia. And so we work with startups and entrepreneurs and the existing ecosystem to really understand what's working and how we can do more of that and bring more people into the ecosystem and, and bring more entrepreneurs to the table. Um, so Renat, thank you so much, super inspiring. And I think resilience is, you know, is, is one of the core values, as we know, of being an entrepreneur, especially in this space. Um, I have a question for us all living here in beautiful Indonesia, incredibly biodiverse country with so many natural assets and beauty, and one of the most populous and one of the youngest and fastest growing um, populations, countries in the world. Um, so how do you think about maybe some of the key opportunities for us here working in Indonesia to not only address climate, but also social development issues, because we know these two things go hand in hand. And then secondly, how do we inspire more Indonesian entrepreneurs to get involved in this space and help shape and make this com country even more beautiful and prosperous? Well, I think, first of all, you're on a, in a very, very good uh, place in Indonesia for a number of reasons. So you mentioned the fuel. It's an absolutely rich country, biodiversity, forests but not only that it is the fourth largest country in the world it's the biggest economy of whole southeast asia it's a democracy so there is a, it's safe right indonesia is, is a safe place you're you can walk around nothing happens to you so it's it's a fantastic place if not indonesia then which country would be a role model in this whole world that we have with all those bad news that to, to how to, how to prosper so uh, I just want to make that point. You're, you're, you're already in the right, uh, in, in the right uh, space here. Now, um, what you're doing is absolutely a genius, namely to create an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. Because I also, to your point before, Rob, exactly, that's the, 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 the problem. There's nothing wrong with competing, absolutely. There, there should be a, a competition for the best idea. But in so many cases, we could win so much more if we first listened, learned, shared with other entrepreneurs what has been done, what went wrong, why did it go wrong, what can we learn? If, if that's the spirit, instead of, oh, I know why it went wrong, because you did that wrong and that was bad, no. If, if, we, if we see failure more as an as a, um, opportunity to learn, that's very powerful. So I encourage you to, when you have entrepreneurs on your platform and you have sharing sessions, talk about everything. Talk about also the things that did not go. Why did that plastic collection project fail? What was the reason? What can we learn? And, and st share those views because once again, Indonesia is the place where you can actually scale such ideas and ripple way, way beyond this country. Love it. Thank you, Jen. Now, uh, we pass the mic. Um, uh, oh my God, behind you. 
<laughs> behind you. Uh, cool. So Toby and then uh, Henry. Oh, oh, welcome. Good to see you again, brother. Yeah. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Renat. Uh, very interesting. I'm going to pick your entrepreneurial brain a bit, so it's not about the uh, uh, climate thing at the moment. Uh, when you were talking about the onboarding, you said it was very difficult to get uh, the company culture, etc., across. Do you see a possibility, especially when you're talking now about looking at old projects, feeding in knowledge, um, that AI can take up a big role in that, that you could like feed your knowledge into AI and your partners, and that when you onboard people, they can basically have a much better overview, as deep as they like even, or even ask questions in certain cases uh, about uh, how the company culture works. Cool. Just, just behind you, Toby, behind you. Yeah. So, so should I? Yeah. No, first of all, I mean, AI will disrupt a lot of things and is already disrupting many things. On the flip side, by the way, if you're hiring people, don't expect one single cover letter to be written by the person. It's all written by ChatGPT. So, uh, so it goes both directions, right? Guilty! <laughs> um, no, uh, honestly, I think that, that it will make uh, a big difference. And we, of course, as entrepreneurs, we have to be careful also. Um, in the end, AI can help, but net-net, you need to know the person. I, th I believe, I'm a strong believer that there is this last, even in the middle of AI, we are not robots, we are humans. And we, have, we come with our baggage, we come with our stories, we come with our views. And I think it's very important that in spite of uh, AI having checked all the resumes and have given you a selection, the last interview should be you and the person and you should be able to talk and find out are we clicking, does it, make, does it match? And I strongly believe that last part is not going to get disrupted. Actually, on the flip side, those companies who are still good at having that human level, will, in my opinion, will probably succeed those who have optimized everything. Having said that, it's certainly going to make things more efficient and uh, make things more streamlined, which is good for all of us. I mean, even if you apply for a job and you have no chance, what's the point? It's, it's, I, I think there's a lot of benefit in having AI helping the selection. Thanks, Toby. Great question. Behind you. So same, same place, Guzman. Same place. Sorry, the mic was stuck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Renan. Thank you for your insights. Appreciate you sharing them with us tonight. Uh, hearing you speak makes me think about um, the future a lot and how to predict the future. And some people believe that investment firms are some of the best people and organizations to predict the future. And so you look at Ray Dalio with Bridgewater Associates predicting the, the rise of China and decline of the US or uh, Balaji Srinivasan with Anderson Horowitz predicting uh, the decline of fiat currency and the rise of digital currencies. I'm curious for you, whether it's within the field of sustainability and the environment or entrepreneurship or anything else, just given your experience, what are some ambitious and of some of the most interesting predictions you have for the next 100 years or so? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> we, that guy is a plant in, in the audience, right? He's going to disappear after tonight. He's going to fly out of the country. You're never going to see him again. Great question, man. I'll give you the afterwards. You know, there's this thing. I can tell you, I can predict the stock price and I can predict the time, but never at the same time, never the combination. No, it's just, uh, I think you have to be a little bit careful. I, I was at the World Economic Forum this year, and frankly speaking, I, I, I go there more or less every year, and this year, what, what surprised me was the level of uncertainty. So I, I, you, you hear from CEOs, from, from governors, from, from government uh, officials, and I, my impression was, Perhaps it's different in Indonesia, but uh, at least the, the crowd in, in Europe, there's a lot of uncertainties. Start with the wars we have in, in Europe. I mean, absolutely nobody can seriously predict on what's going to be next in Ukraine and Russia. This is black box. And it's, it's happening like a thousand miles from our, uh, from our homes. That creates an anxiety in people's brains, right? It's, it's not, you, no, no AI bot can tell you how that's going to play out. And you have the whole thing in the Middle East, which is distracting people. You have, and then of course you have, and that's perhaps starting to be a little bit of a prediction now, what a lot of us underestimate, in, again in Europe, perhaps again not so much here in Asia, is that the ma vast majority 
of African farmland is unirrigatable. It's too far away from any source of water that you could ir uh, irrigate. In Morocco, for example, only 5% of farms are even technically irrigatable. Now, with climate change doing what it's doing right now, and I'm sure you've seen the stats, right? It's off the charts last year, and it's off the charts this year. There is going to be a couple of hundred million, a couple of hundred million people from Africa who simply have no more food to eat and no more water to drink. They will go somewhere, right? They will not just stay there. And there, th that's going to be a, a challenge Europe has to be uh, ready for. And, uh, and, and start doing whatever we can. And in this sense, it's frustrating me a lot that we have such important topics ahead of us, but we're distracting our brains with things that we have been talking about. I mean, is this project perfect or that project perfect? Guys, <laughs> what is this conversation about? We need all projects, even the not perfect ones, at least they contribute something, right? And that, that's, for, um, uh, that, that's for me a bit of a frustration. Uh, currently, I think the world has lost a little bit its ability to really focus on the important topics. So that's certainly one. Another one we just mentioned before is clearly uh, AI. I personally, but this is very personal, I, I don't believe personally that this disruption by digital currencies like Bitcoin is going to be such a game changer. It's, it's a currency among many. But what is going to be game changers is AI. That's certainly going to disrupt a lot of things that we, we have done uh, in the past. A, a third one, it's absolutely happening, luckily, now a good one. We should always uh, end a session on a positive note. Renewable energies are absolutely unstoppable. They, they have, they're past the tipping point. They're going to happen in some countries faster, in some uh, countries uh, slower. But this is happening. So in uh, 20, 30 years from now, we will produce our power very differently than we do today. That's, oh, that's, that's already clear. So you see there's some difficult things, but also some good things that are happening. Three, three great ones. Great question. Don't leave the country tomorrow. Okay, stay, stay. <laughs> He's going to leave the country. Uh, Detlev, you got the mic. Oh, no, you're not. Okay, just pass it over, over here. We've got Jana and we've got gentlemen over here as well. So we'll get the mic to you. Uh, Alex, you, you want to do a quick intro or, you, or you're good? Yeah, just leave it, leave it there, right? And Sean as well, because I want people to see who's here. This is called Speak Up Monday, Destination Indonesia. So it is an unapologetic um, primary, secondary source for people which are here doing what they're doing and for people outside to see, oh, these kinds of people are doing these kinds of things in Indonesia. Great. That's the reason why. So maybe 30 seconds, man. Uh, you're always ready. Let's wait for the, the camera. Thank you so much, Robert. So my name is um, Alex Kotick. I do a lot of different things. Um, I run a boutique investment bank called uh, Abundant Impact Ventures, focused on the impact sector. Uh, relevant to tonight's conversation, um, I've, I've got the exclusive arrangement uh, for financing uh, carbon capture and transformation projects through a company called uh, Carbon Optimum. And uh, yeah, I, I was... Uh, Thinking about asking you this this question or not, uh, even though we, uh, we we met earlier today, um, but it'd be great to hear uh, a moment in the World Economic Forum that really touched you and really made you feel like there was hope, because that's the audience where world leaders convene. That's when people get together, and uh, maybe if you could uh, uh, tell us uh, uh, an anecdote or a story that, that really kind of made you think, wow, this is, uh, this is progress. Thank you. Uh, you pass the mic front to Sean. Yeah. yeah, so the, the World Economic Forum is a very special place. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, of course you have, you have, you have all the, the big speeches by big guys and, and all that. And that's typically all scripted and you can all watch it on TV and it's not, you're not jumping off the chair. What the magic that is happening there is really the, the side meeting. Sometimes the random meetings in a, in a coffee bar where you, you just randomly bump into somebody and that person happens to have a technology in a country that you were just thinking about and, 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 and he or she just comes up with it. So that's the, the fascination. One anecdote, <laughs> uh, 
I'm not going to tell you which country because it's, uh, but I was actually queuing for a toilet and a, a guy was in, uh, ahead of me and I This better be good, Renat, I'm sorry. I started this chatting be good. with him and after a while we go like, hey, where are you from? And he mentioned his country and I asked him, oh, okay, cool, what are you doing? He said, I'm the president. <laughs> It was good. Recovered, recovered, recovered. Very, very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so now the reason why I asked you, Brother Sean, is because I think you're amazing, man, from the bottom of my heart. So I love people to see and to know what you do. I know you don't, I know you don't like talking much, but you've got enough time. So get, get him ready. Sean's going to say something that he can share. Just, just give him a second to, to mic you up. We... Um, I used to run a project called Tomisi Recycling, um, which uh, was started by Renat's boss uh, back in 1998. It was a, uh, one of Renat's bosses, I guess Mr. David Cooper. Uh, and I do the carbon accounting um, and I, I, for a 50 ton per day organic composting facility, which uh, is only alive because of carbon credits. And, and uh, it's one of the big uh, income streams. Uh, I have an environmental engineering company called Eco Mantra, which I co-founded with my business partner, Maitri Fisher. Um, and I build decentralized composting facilities where I redirect money into villages and build composting facilities uh, across Bali and elsewhere. Um, and, but yeah, mainly I love thinking about this question of building trust in the future and how to regain that. I think it's an incredibly interesting question. And um, I would love to talk to you more about it, Renat, and maybe after this session and or next week or something. We'll do after the session. Thank you, Brother Sean. Pass it on to Jana and gentlemen over here, the questions. So here's the thing, right? The people that have spoken, I have a lot of time and appreciation for, right? Because again, like, you are the people taking things forward and not to uh, put anyone above anyone. Um, what I really appreciate about you is that, you know, you have found, okay, <laughs> the motto of Indonesia is unity in diversity or united in diversity, right? Binika Tunggul Ika. So personally, I embraced unity and diversity from about 12 years of age, growing up in kids' homes and in London and another story for another day. So I really appreciate when people actually authentically make real moves to work with people which are different from them. Unity in diversity. So what he has managed to do, and very humble in the way that he's described it, is that he's managed to, you know, to bridge that gap between Indonesians and foreigners on projects which are fulfilling, impactful, and really meaningful. And that's why I just w wanted you to say something um, because, I, again, I know that people know you, but a lot don't. And I, but I want people to make a note of what you and everyone else who's spoken, um, how you're contributing to this ecosystem at large. Thank you, brother, and everyone else who's spoken. Thank you. So over to who's got the mic? Yana. She's probably written the questions down. I don't know how the camera's going to find you underneath the TV screen. Come forward. Come forward. Come, just come through and stand up because we can't see you. Just come forward. Yeah. All right, uh, gorgeous too. I mean, why do you want to hide behind a screen? Come on. I've got a good chair in there. All right, there, there, there you go. All right, so we'll get the camera on to you, darling. Give Guzman a moment and we'll, we'll, we'll get your question, okay? Yep, ready. Uh, so I was going to ask you because of uh, your experience, because you're saying the tendency towards renewables is, you know, it's getting much better and we all see the pricing is changing and, you know, what's going on in Europe. Um, but I wanted you to comment on a dark side of it and the waste that it produces and like the dark side of the green tech, um, renewables, uh, electric batteries, you know, EV adoption, which you guys were promoting with South Pole and all that. What do you think about the technologies that are used right now for utilization, the dark side of it, like wind, uh, windmills, for example, you know, they put them up in uh, uh, Europe in the middle of the ocean and apparently not many people know that there is no marine life around within a huge diameter and 
what do you think about the dark side of green tech and uh, what's the best technology in terms of utilizing? Do they exist yet for the batteries, lithium batteries, the danger behind it, the way they're exploding and all these kind of things? Because people, a lot of the time, they're unaware and conscious and they hear green tech, they hear renewables and they think that it's great. Same with electric transport and all that. So I would like to learn from your experience. Th thanks, Jana. If you pass the mic, just over here to the gentleman over here. Thank you very much indeed. All right, so over to you. Yeah, so uh, let's be very clear. There is no technology and l at least not any way of power production which is coming without any problems. Okay, so the only 100% clean kilowatt hour is the one you don't consume, the one you save. So energy efficiency, just like saving power, is, is the one and only thing that is 100% clean. Same for transport. You drive your car to Ubud, uh, it's a gas car or an EV. In both cases, there is going to be a little bit of damage done. Now, um, perhaps to your point about trust, I must say there recently has been a huge amount of misinformation in the media placed by certain interest groups. Just an example, there, uh, just a, a few months back, there was a, uh, in the east coast of the US, there was an NGO campaigning against offshore wind farms because it destroys the whales around it and, and makes them like the, the noise makes them not hear well and whatever. Turns out this is completely untrue and turns out this NGO was funded by a different NGO and that NGO was funded by the oil industry. And that you can see on The Guardian, it was a, an article back then. So it's just an example how influence, how certain interest groups are deliberately uh, basically bamboozling your brains. And of course, lithium is not nice. If you look at these uh, mining fields in, Ch in, in Chile, for instance, it's not nice to, to mine um, lithium. But study after study has actually shown that um, EVs, after I think the, the, the number is 13,000 kilometers, after the, that's the damage you have to drive to get the battery back. Everything beyond that, the EV car is greener than the, the gas powered car. So it's not nothing. It's not that the EV car is, is a holly, is holly, and uh, about 13,000 miles, uh, kilometers, but beyond that, it's, it's greener. And so what I'm advising all of you to do in this, in, in this polarized world where a lot of, to your point, a lot of information is floating around, always check the source, always try to get a second opinion. Is that really the case? Is it really true that these wind farms are distracting the birds? Or, is it, or might there be a study saying otherwise? So I think all of us as consumers and as entrepreneurs and as scientists, we have to be very, very careful what kind of information we we, we consume. Uh, and, and, and perhaps last point, and that's a very difficult one, this world is not black and white. Even if Twitter and Facebook and, and TikTok would love it to be, it's not everything 140 characters. There's pros and cons. And sadly, in this world, that has become very, very difficult. Uh, a project or an endeavor which has some positive sides and some negative sides, very difficult story. It's either good or bad. Uh, and, and that is something I also hoped all of us can contribute. Let's become advocates for pragmatism, for letting other opinions count, and for fact-checking. Who's behind it? Who said it? That's a great point. And that fact-checking is, is, is key. So we have the last question. Now, before we, we, we go to the last question, I just want to give you just an idea of what's going to happen now. So we'll have the last question, then I'm going to ask you, you know, for, for a sum up, if there's anything that you'd like to say that you haven't said, or maybe reiterate something that has. We'll close the show, then we'll have a photo with everyone, right? So everyone get it in a photo. Then after that, those who want to stay behind for like a little private session with, with Renat can do so. If you don't, that's okay, all right? So that's the order. Last question, sum up photo, private session, or go home, <laughs> all right? Okay, so sir, thank you for being patient uh, w w with you being the last one. We'll just wait, Guzman, can you get him in or is he at the wrong angle? Is, you got him? 
All right. So over to you. Thank you All very right. much. All right. Thank you. And Renee, nice to see you again. I, I saw Renee last Thursday. My name is uh, Toby Naji, and I'm the founding partner of Asia Venture Fund, which is a climate and, and sustainability fund. And our locum is Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, Singapore as well. And we're aiming to build a $100 million fund that will address some of the issues around um, climate and sustainability. And coming back to what you were saying, the young lady over there, I can't Yana. Her name, Yana, is that we are actually trying to address some of the issues around, say, electric vehicles and, 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 and the technologies. And we see some amazing technologies and just think that the EV lithium is only a transition. So there are amazing technologies out there actually can actually bypass lithium and we'll, we'll be seeing those in the future. But one of our roles is also to look at recycling of things like wind turbine blades, solar panels, right? Um, they can be reused, lithium batteries that can be um, brought down to its basic elements. So these are the sort of projects we are looking for. We're also focusing on developing projects in Indonesia as well. So that's why I'm here in Bali. I'm, I'm a newbie to Bali, I've um, come 2022, but I love it. Um, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, but my question is, is, is around ESG. And we talked about Larry Fink a moment ago, and he was attacked from the left and the right. So my question is, um, Larry Fink has said that ESG is dead. And he says we need to take a pragmatic approach. What, what's your, your view on that? And be, what is beyond ESG? Well, I think the reason why I said ESG is that is actually the reason I mentioned, right? Uh, you just can't win, especially not in the US, with ESG, because uh, uh, yeah, you're getting attacked from the right for woke capitalism, and you're getting attacked from the left green for greenwashing. And that's uh, <laughs> so interestingly enough, there's actually a new term for me. I'm not sure if you've heard it. It's called transformation finance. So the, the new buzzwords that they have introduced is now transformation finance. Watch out for that. That's the, the new hot shit in, in the space. Right. I've also um, heard him talk about energy efficiency. We need to come back to more pr pragmatic approaches such as energy efficiency, which really don't cost anything. It's just a matter of focusing on the resources. But I think, it's, that's, I think we discussed this last Thursday. It's quite a boring sort of topic, isn't it? What do you think about these sort of uh, approaches? No, absolutely, as discussed before, I mean, the, the one kilowatt hour, which is a good one, is the one you don't use. So, big, big case. And by the way, at South Pole, we're doing a lot of uh, consulting work for companies how to decarbonize. And what we do then typically is we create these so-called abatement curves. So, we list all the carbon emissions and go from left to right, the cheapest 10%, the second cheapest, and it, as you go to the right, it's becoming very expensive. And guess what? Typically, the first 10, 20% have negative carbon pricing. Negative. So it's minus $10 a ton to reduce those emissions. And that's the, where the ineff efficiency comes in. Mm. So I think it's a very big uh, case. Mm. The co reason why it has proven to be uh, sometimes difficult to create a business model for entrepreneurs is that typically energy efficiency has to be done by the owner of the plant and so it's 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 more an engineering piece it's it, there is some efforts to contracting so i i, I know of some companies who come in and say hey uh look I'm, I'm tell me your power bill i'm going to supply power to you let me let me fix it for you and i'm making money out of the savings but uh it is it is complex because the typically those factory owners don't want to let an external person mess around with their uh, infrastructure so that that's why uh it, it some of those energy efficiency efforts have been a, a, a bit slow but in principle absolutely absolutely that's the the number one thing mm. it starts by the way here in indonesia just i don't know if uh, if you know about jakarta spends about a third of its power on air conditioning. Yeah, now, if you just built the buildings differently and made central cooling yeah. or cold channels, you could already save a huge amount of power. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it just shows how obvious this, this, this point wow. is. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a sexy approach, yeah. is it? It's just yeah. pretty boring, as opposed so, to, say, carbon capture and yeah. all that sort of stuff, yeah? So look, really great to see you here. We'll have a chat afterwards. Jana, did you finish your question? Okay. We don't want to know how you feel about it. We want to know your knowledge. 
All right. Uh, second about waste. Well, the, the, of course, if you discard all your used equipment, it's going to pile up in landfills and it's not a beautiful sight at all. But luckily, there is a, a lot of research and a lot of companies actually ongoing who, are, who start to recycle. For example, wind uh, turbine blades. The next generation of wind turbine blades will be recyclable. Um, that, that's of course very important because otherwise you create that waste uh, problem. And then it all uh, once, uh, as I said before, it's it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. You have to make a full cost analysis and not only full cost but also full impact assessment. What is the total cradle to grave impact of a wind farm as compared to a coal-fired power plant? Yeah. Keep in mind you have to recycle the coal-fired power plant as well once it's done. By the way, the most horrible plants to recycle are nuclear power plants. Yeah. It takes forever and you have nuclear waste. So you can choose whatever technology you want. You will have a waste problem. And it's now a question, which is the least bad option? And so far, the studies I'm aware of show that even if uh, wind and solar are, uh, you know, they do have their damage, per kilowatt hour over lifetime, it's less than you running your coal plant, and it's also less than you running your nukes. Man, uh, <laughs> we could have another conversation about that, but what we're gonna do, thank you for the, the repeat, Jana. Um, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna begin to wrap up um, the show for tonight. Remember, the last question for you, Renat, is anything that you've missed? We haven't dealt with media. Um, one of our points here was, uh, yeah, some tips dealing with media. So maybe in the, the last part for you, after I finish this little wrap up, might be uh, whatever it is you wanted to say, um, plus uh, any tips on, on that you could impart to people here. Remember, everyone is invited for a photo straight after this. And then after that, those who want to stay for a little private session uh, won't be televised or recorded in any way. Um, you're more than welcome to. So why you got, you got a minute and a half to think about it, Renat? So basically, thank you for everybody who's come. Um, very important topic. And I can see that people are you know, they're, they're somewhat conflicted, but a lot of people are passionate about it, which is represented by the audience here. For those of you watching at home, it's great that you're watching, but you should be here in person because each episode attracts the people that, that gravitate towards that episode. So what that means is that the guest is spectacular, amazing, all of those things, right? But it's the people that come that you want to connect with, like Sean, like Alex, like Jen, Detlev, and Toby, and Henry, and all these other people which are here. They're the ones who live in Bali, who are here, and yourself, sir, um, living in Bali, who are doing things. These are the guys you want to connect with. By the way, Alex's group, Ecosystem Regenerative... Re regenerative Transformation is the largest WhatsApp group. I always struggle on that one. Regenerative Transformation. Uh, change it, change it. We got right. We got scale, scale, climate action. That one I can say. Sean's one. So there's, there's lots of people doing incredible things here. So the, the the last thing I want to say before I hand it over is that next week is another really important show. So Miss Indonesia 2022 her name is Lakshmi Denith. Now I interviewed her mum two or three years ago, Janet, who is amazing, Australian. Uh, she is the founder, creator, producer of Ubud Village, Ubud Food Festival and Ubud Re Readers and Writers Festival. Been going for two or three decades. Let's say it again. They've been going for two or three decades, 20 or 30 years. And she's also an incredible restaurateur uh, in the Ubud region. Now, Lakshmi, um, 2022, won Miss Indonesia. She is obviously beautiful, but such an incredible person. And when you think about this, Indonesia, the fourth most populous country in the world. When you think about the, the general election that was just held, think of the, the electorate who are registered to vote right? 60% of those plus were under 30. I say it again, 60% under 30. Indonesia is a young country, right? With so much potential, which it's realizing as we go. And I love Indonesia, as most of us do here, and the president and so on and so on and so on. But she represents the under 30 generation that is empowering Indonesia into the future. And 
she is extremely cognizant of the fact that she has a profile and she has an impact to talk about Indonesia, to carry Indonesia with her on her journey. She is both Indonesian, her, her mom is Australian, her dad is, is Balinese, Indonesian. Incredible mix, incredibly humble, incredibly bright, incredibly smart, incredibly aware of all these different elements that make up Indonesia. So we're going to have a really great conversation next week about that, what it means from that perspective. So anyone here who's, who wants to make Indonesia a home or thinking about it should come. Definitely listen in, but you're better off to come, right? She, again, I can't speak her praises uh, highly enough. I really, I really enjoyed the time I spent with I met her two or three years ago, and then she became Miss Indonesia, and then we met again like last week or something, had a big conversation. I said, right, you got to be on the show? Yes! So it will be amazing. Come in person, come and see her. She's really cool. So thanks again, Tropical Nomad, Guzman, where is IU and Brother Hadis, making it very easy, inspired by our brother Ichi, who's not here at the moment. Thank you to you, the audience, who have come in person um, to really get a good insight into what's going on and to meet Renat and to meet each other. And thank you, Brother Renat. This is the, the follow-up to an interview that we started two or three years ago before COVID started. Lockdown happened straight after that, exactly. but not this time. <laughs> but not this time. No, no, no. Right. And again, you know, you're tied to Indonesia from the, the years you came before, the wife and, and etc. that you have now. Great to see you here. Great to have the opportunity to sit down, have a chat, to release and to share some information that's important for those on the entrepreneurial journey, especially in the climate area but also entrepreneurism in general and also just it's just great to see you man i mean we we, we jam well I, I like her as a person it's it's good no thanks a lot uh, once again rob for having me it was a great pleasure and i certainly will always remember that last night before the lockdown and actually i got a lot of angry whatsapp messages what the fuck are you doing you're still doing live shows you should be at home and locking down and, oh so sorry so we just, <laughs> what, what? <laughs> So it was. Uh, it was bad. Oh. <laughs> the, so uh, oh. Con contact tracing. Stop yeah. it! Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It was interesting that this co you know that this COVID pandemic brought the polarization between so many views, yeah. and in a way, <laughs> ironically, we have the same with climate right now, where you have just totally diverging views, and uh, and you will like in COVID, you will probably not be able to reconcile these views. And perhaps that's my last point now. Who can, who has a shot of actually finding common ground between those extreme uh, positions? It might be entrepreneurs, because who could be against, you know, doing a project here, employing some people, trying something out, bringing value to local communities, uh, that's what entrepreneurs do. So I often believe that entrepreneurs are probably this rare species of people who just don't care about the polarization. It's just like, you know, whatever. As long as you're supporting me, you can be pro-COVID or against COVID or whatever. I don't care. I have a business and I want you as a follower. Yeah. So perhaps uh, uh, us entrepreneurs and, and all of you here, that's perhaps in this world of so many diverging views, really our mission let's be the people who find common ground for the sake of the purpose and perhaps by this we can make the world a little bit of a more hopeful place that's what i hope and once again thanks for having me and uh, thanks rob for this uh, great opportunity round of applause renai huberger thank you very much